thanks for joining me. I'm here with another brief video that will act as a learning supplement for a paper I'm very excited about that's coming out in Critical Care Horizons shortly. And this is a, an amalgam of cardiovascular and respirothoracic physiologies onto a single diagram to help you think about these things occurring in tandem. Once again, the lightning bolts of knowledge emerge. So let's get started. So in the first figure, I want to talk about the RON diagram, and this is a graphical representation of the relationship between pressure and volume of the chest wall, the lungs, and the chest wall, and the lungs together. So on the x-axis here, it's labeled airway pressure in centimeters of water. Uh, so this is the amount of uh, pressure that's being say, forced into the airway um, of the lungs and the chest wall separately. And then on the y-axis is the volume. So this first uh, curve here, this is the chest wall compliance curve. So you need to think of this as the chest wall by itself. So if you sort of had, you know, literally a chest wall and you removed the lungs and then you systematically varied its volume or systematically varied its pressure and then measured its volume, this is the curve that you would get. And this would be, in theory, the chest wall that's not inspiring or expiring. It's sort of like what I call chest wall diastole. It's the chest wall at rest. Uh, and so if you start here, let's say follow this point here, at a very low chest wall volume, you actually have a negative pressure. Now don't be confused by negative and positive pressure. There's no such thing as negative and positive pressure. It's just less pressure and more pressure. Uh, the negative and positive comes from this artificial landmark that we place here, which is atmospheric pressure, uh, which is just our reference point because we're anthropocentric and we like to think of things in terms of the atmosphere around us. But this is just less pressure and this is just more pressure. So think of it that way. So you start at the small volume. So down here to make things a little bit less abstract, because I've been told that I'm too abstract, I've, I've uh, made this little diagram of like a collapsed chest wall. So this is the, let's say this is the IVC and the diaphragm, the anterior and posterior chest wall. So then if you were to apply some pressure, I think I'm being paged. Uh, if you were to apply some pressure, let's say you just artificially pushed some airway pressure into this collapsed chest wall and you created this increase of pressure, which is what these little positive marks are, you would increase the pressure along the x-axis and you would increase the volume of the chest wall along the compliance curve. So it would move up to there and the chest wall would increase in volume. And so now yeah, you reach this new size and it would do so along this compliance curve. Now what about the lungs. So now if you were to take the lungs by themselves and create a pulmonary compliance curve, you would get this shaped curve. So this is the lung at a very low volume, and then as you increase the pressure within the lung by itself, its volume would increase along its compliance curve. And again, this 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 is a static pressure. This says nothing about airflow. It's if you were to increase the pressure and then measure the volume, increase the pressure and then measure the volume, it's occurring when there's no gas flow. So if you were to start at a very um, small pulmonary volume, you would have a pressure kind of close to atmospheric pressure. There would be a little bit of volume retained in the lung at uh, atmospheric pressure. But if you were to then, say, give a breath into the lung, you would then increase the pressure within your lung here, and you would inflate it to its volume. And you would then have this point here. So for this increase in pressure, you'd have this volume. Now, if you were to sum these curves, so if you were to mathematically add the pressure required to increase the lungs to this volume to the pressure required to keep the chest wall at this volume, so say this is positive a few and this is negative a few, well then this sum becomes zero or atmospheric pressure. This is the compliance curve of the lung and the chest wall together, and this occurs here. This is the balancing point at functional residual capacity. So if you were to consider, let's just say, atmospheric pressure, so it's zero pressure, 
you can look at the volumes of each of these curves separately. So if you had just the chest wall at atmospheric pressure, the volume is quite high. The chest wall wants to expand outwards. If you have the lungs at atmospheric pressure, the volume is actually quite low. The lungs want to recoil inwards. But if you look at the two of them together, the volume of the lung and the chest wall together is, is not quite between the volume of the lungs, or the volume of the chest wall and the volume of lungs, but it's a little bit higher than the lungs because the chest wall is expanding it out, and it's lower than the chest wall because the lungs are recoiling it back in. So this is this balancing point you have at functional residual capacity, and I've used this analogy before, but if you've been in the operating room during open chest surgery, when the surgeons put the saw through the sternum, what immediately happens is the chest wall recoils outwards and the lungs retract inwards. And it's because of these um, differing characteristics that you see this. So then you can have disease states. So what that was the chest wall, the lungs and the respiratory system. Sure, I should say that this is RS is the compliance of the respiratory system in the normal state. But in somebody who's very obese, you can see that the chest wall pushes rightward, in effect decreases the capacitance of the chest wall. And that is for the same, let's say, volume at functional residual capacity, the pressure required to keep that volume is much, much higher because of the increased um, load placed on the, on the chest from, from the patient's body habitus. Um, in the obese chest wall, actually, it's interestingly, most of the data suggests that the compliance or the slope of the curve doesn't change all that much. It's actually just a, almost a pure rightward shift in the compliance curve. Um, and then you can also have diseases of the lungs. So if you had a stiffening of the lungs, like say from bad ARDS, the, the compliance curve for all intents and purposes shifts down and rightward. It's, that's, not entirely true. The, the pure elastance of the lung actually in the ARDS actually stays roughly similar. It's just that the volume that's available is much diminished. So you have this concept of the baby lung that appears to uh, increase um, the required pressure to, to obtain a certain volume. Um, and then when you sum these two curves like we did the first time, you can see that the respiratory system here becomes incredibly stiff. So uh, it's shifted way down into the right. What's the clinical relevance of these curves? Well, the re in the patient who is paralyzed or heavily adapted with the ventilator, the pressure that comes off the ch uh, the pressure that comes off the compliance of the respiratory system is the plateau pressure on the ventilator. It's that airway pressure that's being pushed at the proximal trachea that's required to keep the lungs and the chest wall open together. Now, what's interesting about that is that in the patient that's, that's not making any respiratory efforts, there's a certain amount of, of uh, pressure uh, in the plateau pressure that's keeping the lungs open and pressing out against the chest wall. And it's that apposition pressure between the lungs and the chest wall that creates the pleural pressure between the two. So the intrathoracic or pleural pressure actually tracks the chest wall compliance curve as the volume increases. And we'll see that in the next slide. But it's very important to keep that in mind. And the pleural pressure can be estimated. Again, it's an estimate by an esophageal pressure balloon. So in this situation, if you follow this cartoon here, this patient with apparently very stiff lungs from ARDS and a very stiff chest wall from, say, obesity, this will be in the cartoons illustrated by the thickening of the lungs there and the thickening of the chest wall, you can see. So this patient, as you can tell, would have, a, would have very high plateau pressures to achieve a certain volume. So now let's consider that patient we just saw in the supine position. So here's the three curves, more or less, the respiratory system, the pulmonary compliance, and the chest wall compliance curve. And now when you prone the patient, so this is the important part of this, uh, of this um, publication that's coming out, is what happens to this patient's physiology when you prone them? Well, there's lots of interesting things that occur when a patient is prone. But primarily, there are two things. Firstly, 
because of anatomic considerations as the sternum and the um, the ribs as they oppose into the sternum um, is are placed onto uh, downwards onto the onto the bed essentially um, the chest wall becomes stiffened and so its compliance curve shifts down to the right so you can compare those two curves but simultaneously the the uh, posterior portions of the lungs tend to recruit at least in um, certainly in, in um, certain forms of ARDS uh, there's there can be more or less recruitment but for this illustrative site, let's say that the posterior portions of the lungs recruit, so actually the compliance or the apparent compliance of the lungs can improve. So the pulmonary compliance curve shifts up and leftward a little bit. And so what's interesting here is that the stiffening of the chest wall and less stiffening of the lungs actually results in a compliance curve of the respiratory system that is very similar to in the supine um, situation. So more stiff chest wall, less stiff lungs, the respiratory system becomes a wash between the two. So now let's consider what happened. Let's say this is a very obese patient. So you've applied 20 of PEEP at the proximal trachea. So 20 of PEEP is applied to the respiratory system compliance curve. And then if you were to trace that across for this given volume, the pleural pressure is on the chest wall here. So here's 20 of PEEP, and now let's say the pleural pressure looks like it's about, oh, seven or eight centimeters of water. Now out here, it's, it's somewhat similar. Now to remove the pulmonary compliance curve just for simplicity, now what you're gonna do is you're gonna dial in, let's say 500 cc's into the ventilator. So now the ventilator's on volume control, you give 500 cc's and you're gonna move the curve upwards to this new situation. Now, the plateau pressure that you get at end inspiration is actually gonna be quite similar because the compliance curves of the respiratory system, as we said, is similar. So it's gonna be, say, roughly 37, say, roughly 37. But what you can see here is because this chest wall is so much more stiff in the prone position, the pleural pressure or the intrathoracic pressure has increased to a much greater degree as compared to the supine position. So here, the pleural pressure is approaching 18 or 19 centimeters of water, whereas in here it's barely at 10. So the plateau pressure stay the same, but the pleural pressure rises here. So the transpulmonary pressure or the pressure across the alveolus, assuming that the, the plateau pressure or the pressure at the proximal airway um, forms a continuous column of air down to the alveolus, the distending pressure across the alveolus is smaller in the prone position than in the supine position. So let's look at this a little bit less abstractly. So let's look at this as a cartoon. So this is the prone patient, anterior chest wall, posterior chest wall, the IVC. This is the patient lying on their back. In this situation, in the supine position, the lung is much stiffer than the chest wall, let's say. So that's why it's illustrated in this manner. So when you give that positive pressure to this lung, the increase in pressure distributes itself more um, significantly into the airways relative to the pleural space. So this is the chest wall pleural space lung. Again, the pressure increases in the pleural space as well, but this cartoon here is just demonstrating that it's increasing more in the airway and the alveolus relative to the pleural space because of the worsened pulmonary compliance in this situation. So what does that do? Well, this causes the pressure around the heart to rise only a little bit because the, the heart is subjected to the pleural pressure. So it doesn't rise as much here, right? So the pleural pressure only went from here to here. So the, the pressure around the heart doesn't increase that much. So the the gradient from the mean systemic filling pressure, which is the pressure in your veins, down to the heart, that gradient doesn't decrease. So there's still blood flowing down this gradient. So venous returned is, venous returned is relatively maintained here. Now here's the interesting point. Let's zoom in on a little area of this lung and chest wall. So this is your alveolus coming in. 
this is your lung, this is your chest wall. As we said, more of that airway pressure, more of the pressure applied or generated from the volume applied by the ventilator distributes in the alveolus in the lung relative to the pleural space. And that tends to cause an increase in this transpulmonary pressure. So that's the plateau pressure minus the pleural pressure. There's an increase in this transpulmonary pressure generated here. And what that does is that pr that's also the pressure across the alveolar capillaries. So these capillaries are collapsed. These capillaries are in west zone one and two physiology where the alveolar pressure is superseding the pulmonary capillary and pulmonary venous pressure. And so in effect, the right heart is now ejecting against the plateau pressure, which is 37 centimeters of water. And so that creates a very high afterload for this heart. So this heart has to eject up against this high pressure. So now blood's got to kind of go up a hill. So blood is in the venous side is still rolling down this hill because the pressure increased minimally, but it's got to go up this hill to get out of the right heart. And so you can imagine you've got blood coming in and not a lot of blood coming out. That's going to result in a dilated right heart. So if you had a transesophageal echocardiogram in, you would see a relatively plump SVC. So what happens when you prone the patient? Well, now this is anterior, this is posterior. And as we said, when you prone them, the chest wall stiffens relative to the lung. So how does that affect the physiology? Well, now, again, the pressure increases in the lung, but it increases in the pleural space more because of the stiff chest wall. So what does that do? Well, because the heart is subjected more to the pleural pressure, the pressure around the heart rises to a much greater degree. Again, we saw the pleural pressure went from here all the way up to here. So from eight or nine to 18 or 19. And so that's gonna diminish the gradient for venous return. The, the, the increase in the pressure around the heart is approaching the mean systemic filling pressure, which is again, the pressure pushing blood into the right heart. So that's gonna diminish blood into the right heart. And what happens when we zoom in here? Well, now this chest wall is stiffened in the prone position relative to the recruited and more compliant lung. So the pressure builds more so in the pleural space relative to the airway space. And so that diminishes the transpulmonary pressure, right? This pressure is diminished. And so now those pulmonary capillaries are less likely to be in West Zone 1 and 2 and are actually more in West Zone 3. So now this right heart has a low afterload and it's ejecting everything through the lung. So now you've got a situation here where you have diminished preload because of the increase in pressure around the heart and you've got diminished afterload. So the heart can imagine there's not as much blood coming in and there's a whole lot more blood coming out. So just by proning this patient now, this right heart you'd expect to collapse. So now we're going to talk about exactly the same physiology, but in terms of guidance. So here's the venous return curve. We've kind of already talked about this in the cartoon. This is this pressure here at the, at the x-intercept. This is the mean systemic filling pressure. This is the pressure head pushing blood into the right heart. This is the venous return curve. Venous return increases as the right atrial pressure on the x-axis decreases. And blood flow is on the y-axis increasing. And so this is that this is the patient in the supine position where the right ventricular afterload, as we saw, was very high throughout the inspiration. So the high afterload is illustrated by the small slope of the right ventricular cardiac function curve and the venous return curve intersecting it at its plateau portion. Now this here on the cardiac function curve, this is the intrathoracic pressure or the pleural pressure that we saw. That's the x-intercept of the cardiac function curve. So um, this results in this intersection pressure, which is the pressure within the right atrium or superior vena cava, uh, barring any cable obstruction. So what happens when you give a breath now? Well, as we saw, the, the pleural pressure rises in the supine position, but not, uh, but not as much as the airway pressure does. So the intrathoracic pressure or this x-axis doesn't rise very much relative to the mean systemic filling pressure. So that venous return gradient is maintained. There's still venous return coming in, 
And because of that high RV afterload, the slope of the cardiac function curve doesn't change at all. So the pressure still stays fairly high because the right heart cannot eject out what it's receiving. So the pressure within the right atrium or SVC is here now, and that's relative to the pressure around the SVC. Um, and that's the distending pressure of the SVC, and it stays relatively large. And as we saw, that resulted in a relatively engorged right heart. And that's this transmural pressure here. So again, just going over that exact same cartoon, what are we seeing here? Well, the, the increase in pressure around the heart is minimal because it is the lungs that is stiff, are stiff, not the chest wall. So the intrathoracic pressure of the cardiac function curve increases minimally relative to the mean systemic filling pressure. So that maintains relatively the venous return to the heart. But at the same time, the pressure within the lungs is increased relative to the pressure around the lungs. So that increases the transmural pressure, increases right ventricular afterload because of West Zone 1 and West Zone 2 physiology. So the cardiac function curve stays flat. It's not ejecting blood out so well. And so the right heart and the SVC remain uh, enlarged. And that's that high afterload. So what happens when you prone the patient? Well, the mean, again, we're making a big assumption here that the mean systemic filling pressure is not changing when you prone the patient, which it probably does. And we're also making a big assumption that the mean systemic filling pressure is not varying as a function of intrathoracic pressure, airway pressure, and PEEP. Um, but we're doing that just to keep things uh, a little bit more simple. So again, intrathoracic pressure. But now the right ventricular cardiac function curve is much improved, and that's because of this lower afterload that we talked about. Now the uh, point at which the venous return and the cardiac function curve meets, this is the intraluminal right atrial pressure or the SVC pressure. Um, and now when you increase the intra, when you give the breath and the intrathoracic pressure increases to a great degree, right? Intrathoracic pressure gets much closer to the mean systemic filling pressure, so venous return falls. But cardiac output, because of this improvement in right ventricular afterload, actually is higher and maintains itself at a higher vol at a higher value on the y-axis throughout the breath because of this improvement in the slope of the right ventricular cardiac function curve. Um, because of the right ventricular afterload. So now the distending pressure or the pressure within the SVC relative to the intrathoracic pressure is shrunk. And that's because, as we saw, the size, the volume of blood within the right heart would expect to shrink under this physiology. So again, let's just go over this exact same cartoon. Now this patient is prone. This is the anterior chest, posterior chest. Now the chest wall is stiffened relative to the lung um, in the prone position the pressure within the heart rises to a much greater degree because of the increase in the pleural pressure. The gradient between the mean systemic filling pressure and the heart diminishes, so there's less venous return coming into the heart. But at the same time, because of the stiffened chest wall, the pressure, the difference in pleural pressure relative to the airway pressure favors a greater degree in the pleural space. So the transpulmonary pressure is diminished there's increased blood flow through the uh, pulmonary capillaries, and there's a lower afterload. So you've got less blood coming into the heart and more blood flow coming out to the heart as depicted here on the Guyton diagram, and you have a diminished SVC volume. So now let's put it all together. Repetition is what works. So this is, again, the supine patient that we saw, um, chest wall compliance curve, respiratory system compliance curve on the y and x axis this is again was the airway pressure and volume and what we're going and this was the volume that you delivered here what we're going to do is we're going to push this down into the z axis so now ventilator volume is on the z axis into the page the chest wall compliance curve is now down into the page respiratory system pressure maintains on the x axis but now we're going to superimpose the guyton diagram here again mean systemic filling pressure venous return blood flow right atrial pressure now on the x-axis. So again, what we said was that the pleural pressure or intrathoracic pressure follows the chest wall compliance curve. So you could draw a line from the beginning of the breath to the x-intercept of the cardiac function curve. And again, because of that high afterload, the slope is impaired 
and the uh, SVC or right atrial pressure is relatively high. When you dial in that breath now on the z-axis here, you've given say 500 cc's, the pleural pressure is going to rise along the chest wall compliance curve and the intrathoracic pressure will rise and the cardiac function curve will shift rightwards as we saw earlier. So this is now the pleural pressure here. This again is the plateau pressure and this pressure between the two is the transpulmonary pressure which is causing that high right ventricular afterload which is why the slope is staying diminutive and you're staying on the flat portion of the Starling curve and the distending pressure is still high. And this is that exact cartoon here. There's a minimal increase in the, cardi the surrounding cardiac pressure because the chest wall is not so stiff. That maintains venous return. So there's blood coming into the uh, right heart. And because of that high transpulmonary pressure here, the difference between the, the intrathoracic pleural pressure or esophageal pressure and the plateau pressure, that's impairing RV outflow because of the collapsed West Zone 1, West Zone 2 capillaries. Now, for the prone patient, exactly the same, flipped into the Z axis like this, but now the chest wall compliance curve is stiffened. The pulmonary compliance curve is improved, so there is a diminution in the transpulmonary pressure. When we apply the Guyton diagram, to the Ron diagram, which is in the z-axis now, the pleural pressure tracks the x-intercept of the cardiac function curve, but because of the lower transpulmonary pressure, the lower afterload, the slope of the RV function curve is improved, so more, more blood is being ejected. When you dial in that 500 cc pressure breath on the z-axis, there's a much greater increase in intrathoracic pressure relative to the mean systemic filling pressure. That causes a large drop in venous return, but forward flow is relatively maintained because of the improved slope or the lower RV afterload because of that low transpulmonary pressure that we see there on the z-axis between the plateau pressure and the pleural pressure. And the, the SVC transpulmonary, uh, transmural pressure shrinks, so the SVC now collapses and the patient is fluid responsive. Again, the exact same cartoon, stiffened chest wall relative to the lung, the increase in pressure around the heart shrinks the venous return gradient, the relative increase in pleural pressure shrinks the transpulmonary pressure, which lowers right ventricular afterload, increases the slope of the RV function curve, maintains cardiac output, because of flow through the lungs. And now you have, just by flipping the patient into prone, a small SVC and a patient that is on the ascending portion of the cardiac function curve. Thanks for watching.